We have been in a series that uh, has just begun that we are looking at in the morning worship services some neglected Old Testament truth for New Testament times. Today, well, let me just ask you, have you ever been lost? Anybody ever been lost? Was that more men or women that raised their hand? Anybody notice? You know what? Based on your age and the area where you're lost, it can at the least be frustrating. At the worst, it can be frightening. I'm not sure how old I was, four or five years old. It was Kenny Holbeck and me. He lived next door to me on Elm Street where we were growing up. I don't even remember how it happened. I don't remember what we were doing, but we were walking and we were talking and whatever ended up going on, we went off our block. No, we didn't just go off our block. Then we got confused, and every turn that I made was the wrong one. Some might say that has not totally reversed itself, <laughs> hypothetically speaking. But we found ourselves, only afterwards do we come to realize, in the next town over. And to my knowledge... It is the only time that I have found the back of a police officer's vehicle and ended up needing to get a ride from him. It was horrifying to not know where you are, to not know anyone that can be able to help you. I never thought about it, but I had to really make my mom afraid. She didn't know where I was. You know what's really sad? Is that we live in a culture where people don't know who they are and they don't know where they're going. It's devastating. And it's something that God has given us resources for. Today's message is entitled, Directions for the Lost. Or another way of putting it is, when all else fails, follow the directions. God has given us, in his word, information that can help us to know about the most important and vital things in life. Why people are not in the word, I don't know. It's counterintuitive. But it happens to be a continued difficulty in the days in which we find ourselves, I am convinced that God has given us direction and principles of living throughout His Word. Can I get an amen? I'm convinced. You need to be convinced. This book, and we don't worship the book, but the things that we find in the pages of this book can change your life, can be of such benefit in the midst of the difficulties that we go through. You know, in the New Testament, there are some portions of Scripture. You think of uh, First uh, Timothy 3, you think of Titus chapter 1, where there are qualifications for elders. How many here feel that there need to be qualifications before people are put in positions of responsibility and authority and leadership in the church? Can I see your hands? I say amen. We've got our quarterly meeting coming up. We've got a nominating committee that will be selected and individuals' names that are considered. You know what? It's not just a warm body in a position. It ought to be people that have a degree of caliber, uh, of quality in their name. Let me ask you this. How many think leadership is called, called to integrity and quality and the rest of the body is fine with mediocrity? Can I see your hands? You sure? At least you're sure that pastor doesn't think you should raise your name. I'm sure of that. But isn't it something that we are, for some reason, and I'm not talking you down. Please hear me, Payless. I love you guys, you know. But, but, but it, within Christendom, we have this sense sometimes where people get messed up because they start looking at leadership and they hold them to a standard but we don't hold ourselves to the same standard. And I say, shame on us. The whole body of Christ ought to be held to the same standard that we seek for our leadership. Now that, 
in some churches sounds revolutionary. Here, hopefully not. But it, it, it reminds us that there are principles we come across that may be for one group of individuals in leadership, and we don't just walk away from it saying, oh, that's for them. You evaluate them and realize this quality of character that leadership ought to have, that's God's plan and goal for me. Every single one of us. Doesn't matter what age. Doesn't matter what life circumstance you've gone through. If you're a child of God, there is something God is looking for in our life. I want you to remember that because we're going to follow that principle. But can you open your Bibles right now to the book of Deuteronomy? And I'd like you today to go to chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. This has got to be an abbreviated time that we spend in the Word. But I want you to know that in a short period of time, there's some powerful things that we can be able to look at. So you stay with me. Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'd like to go ahead and pick it up in the middle of the chapter at verse 14, because from here on through the end of the chapter, we are going to find some things that God is telling the Jews. Now, you, you know what's going on. If you were here last week, at least you do. At this moment, they have been in the wilderness for 39 years and 11 months. They're less than a month from going into the promised land. And as they go, God is giving instructions, and Moses is the one who's communicating those instructions, and we are finding ourselves in the midst of the text with that. At this moment, they've been following every single day, not just Moses. Listen closely. Don't you put Moses on a pedestal. They've been following the Shekinah glory, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And whenever it moved, they moved. Middle of the night, they stay for a day, a couple of hours, a week, a month. Whenever the cloud moved, they moved. They were to be learning instant obedience to the direction of God in their life. We're still trying to learn that, aren't we? Well, in this passage, instruction is given to kings. You know what's really interesting? That the Jews had no kings at this time. When they moved into the promised land, they had Moses and then they had Joshua, but they were not the king. Who was the king? God was their king. But God knew. The next time that you wonder whether God knows what you're going through, think about this kind of a pattern. God knew that at a later date, they would choose to want to have a king. And when that happened, he gave them instructions for when that moment took place. Does God know the future? How big is your God today, huh? Deuteronomy chapter 17. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, end of the book of Judges, end of the book of Samuel. It's just what they said. Verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You shall not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. And now he gives three clear principles that they were not to have. Verse 16, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. What's the big thing with horses? Some of you live in Payless Park. You may say, hey, I may have a horse. What's wrong with horses? It's not the horse. It was in that culture a symbol of power. The horses and the chariots were used in battle, and you were just infantry, and they were cavalry, you became a battlefield statistic. Horses won the day. And often they would accumulate them. And instruction is given that the king should not multiply horses. And the reason is, and understand this, 
who were they to be looking to as being the power? And the answer is, now think with me for a moment. What is there that you look to for strength and power? Keep on going because we, we don't have a lot of time this morning. This passage, it just is going to run along. He, he says, uh, verse 17, Neither shall you multiply wives for yourself, lest his heart turn away. And, and so he tells us why. Your relationships, they need to be done under God because there's a tendency for your relationships to begin to take the place of God. Can I get an amen over that one? You know, the issue is not uh, multiple marriages. We're not living here in, a, in an area where, uh, you know, we're not in Utah, you know. It's not a matter of multiple spouses that we're thinking of. But I'll tell you this. We often put another human being in front of God. And so we are given another caveat. And this is for those that were going to be a king. Now listen. If it's good for a king, how about for you and me? You know? Is it something that would be worthy of our looking into? No, it's only for kings, not for you. I say to you, we need to be aware of this. Where do we look for our power? Where do we look for our relationships? And thirdly, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Where does he look for the significance in life, the wealth in life? And what we find is that throughout the Old Testament, you look back and you see the kings, and most of them went directly against what the Scripture said they were supposed to. God gave them information ahead of time. He didn't have a, a later prophet who ended up writing a scroll when a king came along, he gave it before a king ever came on the scene. Here are the things that are prohibitions. Here are things that are only going to be detrimental to you. Why? Because when we put things or people in front of God, we're in trouble. Amen? Now, I need to run on, not because there's not more to say, but simply I need to share this. Verse 18, Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book, from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall, by the way, what would this be a copy of? It's the Scriptures. They didn't have as much as we have, but what they had they were to take and they were to write their own personal copy of it. And then he goes on and says, verse 19, And it shall be with him, and he shall read it. How often? Help me here. All the days of his life. And he gives us why. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God. And number two, to be careful to observe all the words of this law and its statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or the left, that he may prolong his days of his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. There are benefits of knowing and following the word of God. You say, I'm not a king. Well, that's why I started the way I started. You may not be an elder today. Does that mean that you don't need to be trying to meet the same qualifications? Or, or, or a Sunday school teacher with, with abilities, knowing the Word and being able to share with others, whatever it would be. I tell you, every brother and sister in Christ, God wants us to be following Him and putting Him first. How do I learn how to do that? What is the basic fundamental building block that all of us need in order for us to go forward in our development with the Lord? And the answer is the Word of God. The scriptures. If someone was going to be a king and would be involved where their life would influence the lives of others, they were told some things they were avoid to avoid, and they're given another thing that they are to embrace. I have good news for you. We have a printing press, and we have copiers, and you don't need to write out your own copy of the 66 books. And all of God's people said, <laughs> but how about the principle? 
How about the principle of being able to get a hold of the Word of God and to read it every single day? How about the principle of not just reading it so that you learn more information? Because we know knowledge puffs up. But he is told, whoever the king would be, before he ever came to the throne, that he was to have a copy, he was to write it out, he was to read it daily, and he was to follow what it said. And he's given reasons as to why you are to do it. You are to fear God. Fear, learn to fear the Lord your God. Why do you and I get in some of the problems that we do? Because we take on something God never intended for us to. God is not resident in buildings on Sundays from 1045 on. God's God. He created everything. He created you and me. He knows us. And he knows what we need. And he's laid it out in the Word of God. And what is one of the things that a study of the Word of God ought to bring to every one of us? And that is a recognition of the holiness of God. Sometimes we think we're good. And then we study about God. And we realize we're sinful. Can I get an amen? We start thinking we're doing fine. And then we look in the Word of God and we find we have no capacity to ever be able to please Him because even our righteousness is like filthy rags. Where did I pick that up? It's in the Word of God. So it teaches me to fear the God. Who in this church needs to be fearing God? Everyone. Every single one of us, including me. Because you got pastors, and they start getting caught up in themselves, and they think they're really something, just like kings think they get caught up in themselves, and they think they're really something. Listen, I have an accountability for every single soul that I'm able to minister to. I am under authority. It is my Lord who needs to be in control. Amen? How about you? Is it different for you? Or is it supposed to be the same? That he should be over each and every one of us. That we would fear the Lord our God. That we would be careful to observe all of his words, of his law and his statutes. That there would be a sense of purpose about our life. Carrying out what it is that God wants us to be able to do. That his heart would not be lifted up above his brethren, that as he obeys, there would be an attitude of dependence or humility that would be something that flows from our life as a result of knowing him and knowing his word. Deuteronomy 17, you say, Pastor, in context, that was to the Jews. It was just before they're going to the promised land, and it was really for them. That's who it was for. And I say, I agree. You ready? I agree. That's exactly who it was written to. That's who it was for. But he, as I look back upon the Word and I see the principles that he's teaching to individuals that are leaders in the Old Testament, I look at that and say, oh my goodness, but that is what I need today. And if we don't study these pages, we don't see this portion. And we don't see this that is, and, and by the way, the rest of the book in the Old Testament is the consequences that came to this unique people group that God chose as an object lesson for the world as they over and over and over didn't do what God asked them to do. You say, why did this happen? Why this consequence? Why this? Boy, God seems so mean. Do you understand that they essentially said, God, we know you're there. We don't need you. And they did their thing. You say, oh, how would anybody ever say that? I want to say this in love, but I want to say this really clear. There are times in your life you may have done exactly the same thing. You say, I'd never do that. You have. Come on, let's just be honest with ourselves. Look, here at Payless, in case you're a guest, I just need you to know we are looking as hard as we can 
to be able to be taking and ripping off these masks whereby we all just look like we're perfect to each other. We already acknowledge we're not, okay? And starting from that reality, who does God want us to be? And we're sure not looking to put on a mask again, that's for sure. We again end up realizing that, that his instructions to those who would become kings would be wonderful instructions for us to follow. Now, I, I know of individuals for their own desire who just wrote out portions of the word, just wrote it, wrote it, wrote it, and I say, praise God, I commend you for that. But I do not call upon you all to sit down and start writing out your 66 books because Deuteronomy 17 said it. I recognize by the grace of God you have access to the word. It is the most purchased book in the world. I think we've got them, don't you? You actually have multiple uh, versions, and, and, and you know, you've you got different translations. That are, stay with a good translation, please. you got questions, ask me privately, but, but stay with the Word. Not somebody else, what they write about the Word. But what were they to do? They were to read it how often? Daily. They were to read it, and they were to heed it. They were to obey what it says, and they to, were to allow the word to draw them into an attitude of dependence or humility. And I say to you, pull out Deuteronomy 17, and this week read it through, and ask yourself, God, am I being the kind of man or woman that you want me to be? Because I think that there is New Testament truths in some Old Testament passages. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning. Oh, God, even as Jesus, as he was here on earth, said on multiple occasions, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, we do want, don't want to just be a hearer of the word. We want to be a doer of the word. And so I pray for myself and each and every one of us here, Father, that, that we would not simply verbally acknowledge the correctness of the information of the message of the day, but that we would seek you. That nothing would keep us from our appointment with God to sit at your feet and to learn from your word and allow us as a result to obey and have an attitude of dependence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.